Hi, and welcome back to the Work From Home Cafe. I am Kate Dessa, and we are back with Andrew Scrivani. Uh, every week, we are coming to you at 12 o'clock PST, 3 p.m. EST, to teach you a new recipe, and Andrew's teaching us how to take beautiful photos of it. Today, we are learning how to make some cocktails, which we haven't done yet, and he's going to teach us how to take some beautiful shots. So welcome back, Andrew. Excited today's episode. We all could use a, a nice drink after a long Monday. Yes, and it's so hot. It's just so hot here that turning on the oven or even getting at the stove today was seemingly uh, ill-advised. So um, during the pandemic on Fridays, uh, on an Instagram Live, I had consistently been doing something called drinks and DJs. So um, my, uh, my niece's uh, boyfriend was staying with us during the pandemic, and he is a DJ, so he brought all his equipment here. So on Friday nights, we would do a live feed where he would play music, and I would mix drinks, and then we would just hold an open sort of conversation. And uh, we had a really good time. It was fun. And uh, we, once Nico went home, uh, I stopped doing it, but uh, I figured it'd be good to revive it a little bit, and especially with some summer drinks today. So uh, we had some fruity, herby, sweet summer drinks like, to refresh us. So here we are today, and you have a little bit of a different today. Um, as always, the surfboard is behind me, so it's, <laughs> it's never too far. Um, but it's, uh, this is my kitchen from a different angle and, uh, we're going to maybe even get outside today and shoot in some of the daylight on the balcony. So All we're going right. to. Are we here? Are we frozen? Oh, oh there no. we go. There we go. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm excited to hear more about these cocktails and like you said it's, it's too hot in jersey to be making uh just hanging out over the hot oven and it looks like taking advantage of that nice weather this weekend you're surfing this weekend you're telling me about right yes as as you can tell i'm very tan uh <laughs> water and uh, I've been surfing an awful lot, so it's been uh, it's been a great way to keep uh, active and keep me kind of sane during the uh, separation from uh, most of my friends and family. So it's uh, the ocean has been a nice uh, a nice help for me. So it's and I'm looking forward to going back out again later. So it's not not too many waves today, but it doesn't matter. It's still fun. So all right, well let's jump into these cocktails. Yes, today's cocktail. So I'm going to do three. One you're probably already familiar with. It's a mojito. Uh, I'm also going to do something called a watermelon crush and another one called a bourbon peach smash. So the bourbon peach smash clearly has bourbon in it. The mojito has um, rum in it and the watermelon crush has um, tequila. So uh, we're using three different types of liquor today. We have fruits, we have uh, limes, peaches, uh, fresh mint, blueberries, and I made these two things, which are uh, a brown simple syrup and a white sugar simple syrup. So I wanted to talk about that first because any good bar setup, you're going to find that a lot of drinks like this use simple syrup. And all simple syrup is, is a one-to-one -one ratio of water to sugar. So basically you take a cup of sugar, let's say, and a cup of water, put it on the stove, simmer, not to boil, basically just get it warm so that everything melts. And then you will, um, and then you will have um, a syrupy, sort of sugary substance that you could use in cocktails, you could use it in your coffee or your tea. It's really nice for, for uh, cold drinks because um, when you put granulated sugar in things, sometimes it doesn't always uh, melt completely. So using a simple syrup is a really good solution for those types of drinks. So if you like iced tea or you're making cocktails, you like iced coffee, having some simple syrup around and it doesn't go bad. You just put it in the fridge and you can have it forever. All right. All right. So let's get started on cocktail one and let me get you down on my tabletop and you can... 
see we're on a we're on a different situation here. Oh, look, you can see me a little bit. Okay, good. So I don't know if that's straight. I don't know. We'll try. We'll try to square it off. There it is. We're square. Okay. So we're gonna do the um, bourbon peach smash first. So the first thing we're gonna do is uh, get a cocktail cup shaker, and I'm gonna get this peach cut up. And we're gonna go with about, this peach is a little bit ripe, so this is actually not too bad. Uh, oh, it's a lot ripe, so we're not gonna use that one. We'll do this one, which is much nicer. And in New Jersey, we have a lot of really good peaches here. This is one of the uh, the products that gets um, that gets produced locally. Corn and peaches is what New Jersey is known for. So I didn't know New Jersey was known for corn. Yep, great corn, really sweet, coming into season, and uh, where it's really um, it's really nice. So um, a half a cup of um, a half a cup of peaches is about what you're using here. I'm using about like kind of two thirds of this peach after I've taken the pit out. We'll put that away for later. So we're gonna take uh, the peaches, which in, I've diced. We're gonna do one ounce. So I have my little cocktail jigger here. It's one ounce and two ounce. So I'm gonna do one ounce of simple syrup. And I'm going to add First, I'm gonna, oh, I gotta put the mint in here too. So I gotta get some mint. I got about five or six leaves of mint. And then I'm gonna use what's called a muddler. So this is a tool that has like a, a ridge to kind of masher on the end. And we use this to kind of mash up everything that's in there. So we're doing what's called muddling at this point. So this, when you hear the term muddle, when you're making cocktails, if you don't know it already, that's what we're doing. We're sort of making a mash. All right. Muddling, and, muddling, muddling, muddling along. And let me ask you, you know, I've, I've noticed a lot of um, cocktails being made with agave instead of simple syrup. Is that something we could switch out here? And do you know what the difference between agave and a simple syrup is? Uh, viscosity for one, uh, agave okay. is the of honey. Uh, so when that hits cold, it's going to seize up and you've ah. noticed to put honey in iced tea or something like that. The, the, the honey seizes up when it hits ice, ice coffee or ice something, you know, and, uh, that is why simple syrup is a little better. It's a looser viscosity and it doesn't seize up when you put it in. So that actually, okay. okay. So, um, I'm going to add our bourbon. I'm using a rabbit hole bourbon, which is a really nice bourbon, obviously from Kentucky, because all bourbon comes from Kentucky, just like all champagne comes from champagne. And I'm going to use two ounces of bourbon, which is this big double jigger, right? And then I'm going to shake it up with some ice. Have you ever taken a trip to the Bourbon Trail in Kentucky? I have. It was really great. So usually when you're shaking something for, for a drink, um, you want to shake it till like, it starts to form a frost. You can see that frost there around the edge of the, the shaker. So that's good. I'm going to get this. I'm gonna fill that up with ice. And I'm gonna pour most of this right back over. Am I supposed to strain this? Hmm. No. Well, I, that's what I'm supposed to do. Aha. Okay. So I got a tiny bit left over. But you see, I have this really nice, frothy kind of drink. It's got little pieces of peach in it. You're supposed you to pull it up a little closer to the camera for us. There we go. Okay. So you see those so, nice chunks of peaches in there. Yeah, it's really nice. And I got to kind of garnish this with a nice kind of piece of peach here. 
And then I have some fresh mint that's from the garden. I just brought the whole plant into the into here just to kind of freshen this up. And actually the ones that are soaking in water, which is another one of our styling tricks, uh, we are soaking our garnish in cold water, which is something that we always do. And now we have a really pretty cocktail. And remind me, soaking the garnish in the cold water helps brighten up the garnish itself and also the flavor of it as well, right? Yeah, it brightens the flavor, it brightens the color, and it keeps it um, fresh and hydrated. So like these, I'm going to take one off the here. You can see these were outside in the heat, so they're a little bit sort of wilty right now. So I'm going to put it in the cold water and see what happens. We'll pull it out of there for the next drink because I think... I think all three of these drinks get um, all three of these drinks get uh, mint. So we're gonna try to keep this. I'm gonna put this in the freezer. Usually not what we do, but I'm gonna put it in the freezer because I don't want it to um, melt away in the time we have between making a few drinks. And I might have to replace the garnish after putting that in the freezer. But yeah, I was going to say, this is one of those items, much right. like pretty much anything frozen, that uh, is quite a uh, thing to tackle in food photography. So is this something that you do typically when you're, or, or do you have, you know, when you're doing a cocktail shot, do you typically have three people making cocktails for you and set, you know, so it's all timed the right way, or are you using your like we are today you know a lot of times when i'm do doing a cocktail shoot um i'll help in the kitchen with the stylist and we'll try to mix them up really quick uh and just keep making them and a lot of times i can you can fake it too by using plastic ice cubes which i have and you have used uh -huh. them. but um today we're going full you know normal everyday ice cubes <laughs> but you know fake plastic ice cubes go a long, long way when you're uh, All right. a hot studio or you have a lot going on so i just tasted this one and uh this is one of the hazards of doing a cocktail shoot is that uh, <laughs> you end up tasting the product of course that's part of the fun of being a food photographer right that is delicious it really is that's great Okay, let's move on to cocktail number two, which uh, is going to be our mojito. Uh, so I'm going to, we are going to put them in a shaker with ice. I have another shaker. And we're going to get ice in there first. Wait, hold on. Put ingredients in shaker. Yes, I'm going to do it this way. So there are a number of different ways to make a mojito, but a lot of times um, they'll muddle the way we did with the first drink, we'll muddle all of the mint leaf in the bottom of the cup. But in uh, in this case, what we're gonna do is we're gonna take everything and put it in and then aggressively shake it up and then pour it all right in the cup. So again, we're gonna use like four or five, maybe six leaves of mint. Um, we're going to put two ounces of rum I put healthy, generous pours in my cocktails. Uh, then we're going to put a tablespoon of sugar. Now you could also use the simple syrup, but since we're gonna aggressively shake this, I put uh, sugar in there. Uh, and now we're ready to shake. So I have this kind of nice shaker with a strainer on the top, but we're not gonna need that because we're gonna pour everything into the glass. And when you say that you're using just regular sugar, just regular granulated sugar straight into the cup? Super fine sugar is preferable, but it's not always available. Like I went to Wegmans today and I could not get any super fine sugar. Gotcha. So Jennifer from Facebook was talking a little bit about- It's stuck to the shaker. Oh no! That's how cold it was. <laughs> I was just 
mentioning Jen Jennifer from Facebook is saying that her uncle used to be an artist who created food shots uh, with with non food a lot, which she piped in when we were talking about uh, fake ice cubes. In your oh. food photography, do you ever uh, use things that are not food to make it look beautiful aside uh, your ice cubes? She said that he used glue instead of milk. You know, I've never done that, but I know that it has been done. So yeah, let me come down to the table so you can see what I've done. So here's our mojito, but it's not quite finished yet. We're going to top it with some club soda. And you can see how the uh, mint all broke up in the shaking process. So it's got all that kind of broken pieces of mint. And then this is our mint that I kind of soaked a little bit in um, So that's the mint I soaked yeah. a little bit. So it kind of refreshed a little bit. But that that's a nice color for a mojito. It's really looking good. So in the freezer you go with the other one. <laughs> so let me ask you this. Are you particular about your ice cubes when you're making cocktails? Because there has been quite an evolution of ice cubes. Or maybe I've just gotten deeper into making cocktails myself. Um, but, you know, they have sphere, square. It looks like those are pretty nice ice cubes. Are those from your freezer or are those a mold that you're using? Those are from my freezer. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Going back to Ash for a second, you know. <laughs> that one must be good then. Yeah, man, day drinking. I'm here. <laughs> day drinking, we're together. It's all good. Okay. The last one is called, I'm going to get you back on the table here. The last one is called the watermelon smash, crush, watermelon crush. So I'm going to first get this uh, mesh strainer. Yeah, I'm going to get you closer here. A little crowded. Okay, so I got the mesh strainer here. And I want to put in these chunks of watermelon. And I'm going to sort of mash them down. I'll use the muddler because that'll help. And I could just mash all this down and get watermelon juice. Right? So ultimately, I want about three ounces of this. So I probably got more watermelon in here. So maybe I'll make it double this time. But well, let's stick to the single so that we don't confuse anyone, so that the recipes are consistent. But this is going to be, ultimately, I only need about three ounces of this. So you can see I got that really nice, rich. Oh, yeah. And I can always come back to this and do some more. But I think I have plenty now. Right, I'm going to put that aside. Can go back to that one. So this is, remember now, this is two ounces this is two ounces, so I'm going to do two and one to get myself to three. Um, All right. So we're going to do it in here. We have a tall cocktail shaker. Uh, so we're going to and we're going to pour this over ice. So I'm going to fill the cup with ice to start. And here we're going to do one ounce of lime juice. So I have to squeeze a lime. So I have this nifty squeezer. And half a, half a lime is usually about, a, about enough. We've got about an ounce of lime juice in there. And tell me, tell me a little bit more about when you put ice in the uh, shaker itself or when you're going to put ice in the drink afterwards. So this one, it looks like we're going to put ice in the shaker with the juice. Uh, the other ones we poured it over. So in, in what instance do you choose which? You know, sometimes you're going to strain what's in this here, but you still want it to be cold. Now, some, okay. some, um, some cocktails are served in different glasses. Like, so when you see something that's served in like a coupe, which is like that flat cup with a stem. A lot of yeah. times you'll 
shaken drinks that are, there's ice in the shaker and then you strain it out. So there's nothing but just a chilled liquid. And then at other times okay. you shake it out and pour it over ice. It's just a matter of which cocktail you're making. But then like the ones we're doing, especially when there's muddled fruit, we're doing both things, right? We're shaking it up with ice and then a lot of times adding ice also when we pour it into the glass to get the right. Okay. So it really depends on the cocktail, but ultimately it's, you know, it's just however the recipe is written for the most part. Gotcha. So, yep. Back to the table. <laughs> okay. So uh, I put three ounces of watermelon juice in here. I'm going to do one ounce of simple syrup. I'm going to use our um, brown simple syrup this time. Just because I like that rich color we already have. I don't want to water it down. Um, we're going to go two ounces of tequila. And is that typically, you know, when you're choosing between brown or uh, white simple syrup, um, is that, are you usually basing it in color? Have an impact um, on the cocktail? That, um, it's taste as well. I think this one is a little bit, the brown one is a little bit more sort of um, uh, caramely, you know, because the, the brown sugar is definitely has a little bit more of a caramel flavor. So if you yeah. want that, richness to it and not just the sweetness, but a, 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 a more of a caramel richness to it, that would be the brown simple syrup. So depending on, I think they are relatively interchangeable, but color helps. If you're going for a darker drink, the darker would help. And if you're going for a lighter drink, the lighter would help. Okay, where am I? Uh, blah, 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 blah. I am, oh, I'm here. So I have this nice cocktail spoon and I'm gonna mix everything here that I just put in here. So I, again, I put in an ounce of lime juice, three ounces of uh, watermelon juice, two ounces of tequila, and an ounce of simple syrup. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna throw my blueberries right in here, because I want them to go right into the cup. All right. So you're not gonna mash up the blueberries at all? No, I'm not gonna mash them up. I'm gonna pour this over ice. And again, this gets a, um, it could get a mint garnish or it can get a, um, it can get a mint garnish or it can get a lime garnish or it can get both. So I have that and I'm going to do what's called uh, the, the sun kissed, that is called the sun kissed wedge. As you can tell, like, like the logo of sun kissed uh, oranges. So the, the way oh. we I'm gonna show you how we cut that in a second. I'm gonna kind of just get it up here. So there's our third drink. Looking really red and pretty. I think that one will hold for a minute. So let me show you how to do a sun kissed cut. So this was something that a food stylist taught me. So you cut the citrus in half so that you have the nice uh -huh. round thing. Then you turn it over and you kind of go on a 45 and you cut through it. And that's how you end up with the, the really pretty sun-kissed wedge. So a All lot right. of cut wedges out of the line this way. And then they have the, um, the little bump on the end. And that really doesn't make for a pretty, um, a pretty wedge. That's a very but, good point. I never thought about that. But this is that perfect kind of pretty wedge that we really like. So... All right, and there we have our watermelon smash crush. I'm adding the two of them, <laughs> getting the two of them used. Okay, now of course my glassware is um, limited here. I don't have the uh, the best glassware, and our our blueberries have sort of sunk to the bottom. So maybe when we're shooting, I can kind of cheat it and get them to come up to the top a little bit. Add a little more ice, and we'll play with that a little bit. Okay, so those are our three cocktails. And do you think that we have any questions about the cocktails we mixed? No, everyone's excited to start making them today. Everyone's excited that we're starting Monday off with some cocktails. It seems like, you know, everyone's stuck at home 
and most bars are closed right now. So we got to learn how to make some craft cocktails at home. I think so. And I think that since a lot of people are on vacation in July and August, day drinking is completely appropriate. Yes, exactly. <laughs> okay. So what we're going to do is um, I want to use some sort of environmental uh, things with our cocktail photography today. So what I want to do is possibly go outside. I wanna, we're going to attempt this and see how it looks. Okay. So bear All with right, me. All right, let's do it. Uh, while I get you uh, going, and then um, I will go outside and we'll start shooting. So let me get set up, and I'll, we'll be right there. All right. So I'll remind everyone today, we, this is the Work From Home Cafe. Uh, you are watching Creative Live TV. My name is Kate. I am the co-host with Andrew Scrivani. He is a New York Times food photographer, a author and one of our amazing instructors. He has a plethora of uh, food photography classes on our website, creativelive.com. And today he is teaching us how to make some delicious cocktails. So we've learned how to make a mojito, a uh, watermelon crush, and a peach smash <laughs> and right now he's setting up outside so we can learn how to take some outdoor photography usually we are just using the natural light from his beautiful windows uh, for our photography but today he's taking us out to the patio so we can get outdoors and we can teach you a little bit about shooting food and drinks while we're here outside. So Andrew is right now uh, still mid quarantine in his home in New Jersey. He usually is based in New York City, but has escaped to the Jersey shore where uh, he will probably be enjoying these cocktails right after uh, we're done with this episode. So um, again, this yeah. is the Work From Home Cafe and yes, he agrees. He will be drinking those cocktails as soon as we're done with this shoot. Um, and again, like I said, this is the Work From Home Cafe. Uh, you're watching Creative Live TV. It is our daily variety show where we bring you into the homes of our favorite creators so that you can see how they are they are creating during quarantine, how they are staying motivated and inspired every day while we figure out what each day brings. And so today, to get us started with uh, some cocktails, and he's excited to show us. He's almost done setting up his outdoor setup. Looks like it's going to be a beautiful setup. Okay. And all right, here we go. What to look at, but um, I guess I should... I should look at this camera to talk, right? So, um, so here we are outside. I have uh, sort of like a little garden out here and I'm gonna set up on, on this table. This is sort of like a little terracotta table, uh, terrazzo table, I'm sorry. Yeah, I was gonna say, it looks like a terrazzo table, very trendy. I think what I have to do first before we do anything is figure out what my ISO is. Cause I think out here, it's gonna be yeah, it's going to be at least, it's going to be at 100, and I'm probably going to need to go with a little bit of a faster shutter, and let's see where we're at. Yeah, I think I need to be at around 200 at 4.5 aperture at about 100 ISO. So that's about where we're going to be right now. And, and can you tell us, like, right now, where is the sun? Um, you know, what at what point in the sky is the sun to give us a little perspective for you? So I am north east facing, right? So if you want to kind of see, I'm, this is what I'm looking at, right? Okay. So I, that's cool. north and east obviously is the ocean. So like I'm pointing directly at New York City, like right here. So okay. um, there, that's due east. So the sun comes up over here in the morning, right around there. And then it kind of goes up and away. So I have sort of this north facing light that we can uh, that we can use for nice diffused lighting situations um, during um, summer. So I can be out here shooting 
and uh, and I have some nice opportunities here. So I'm going to try to fudge this a little and throw a couple of these uh, blueberries in on top and get sort of a, tr a triple shot. But I do think that my peach one is the prettiest of the three. Um, it's held up nicely in the freezer. And uh, I'm going to try to kind of marry these three together, take some of this kind of stuff out of the mix and then take a look at what I have. And it's a little flat, so I might have to add a little bit of bounce, which I'm going to start with. So I'm going to get one of my bounce cards that we've used uh, in the past couple of weeks. And I'm going to and see if bounce you explain to us when you say flat, what, what do you mean by that? Say that again? I said, uh, can you explain to us what you mean by flat? Like, there is not a lot of depth to the photo. What does flat look like when you're looking at something? It means that there's no directionality to the light. So what okay. we're seeing is, um, is sort of a, a, a flatter, even light, which in a lot of cases is fine. But like, if you want some drama, it's kind of harder to achieve and you have no, when you have no uh, directionality to the light. So you either gotcha. add or take it away to create directionality. So like right now, looking at this, my better situation might be to add some black rather than, can you still see that from this angle? Yes, right? Okay. Yep. So I'm going to add black in here and create a little bit of shadowing. And that might help us kind of get a little bit of directionality with our lighting. And I also might overexpose it just subtly. Yeah, it's, it's, um, let's see, I'm working it. And I want to get lower. Yeah, okay, so I underexpose anyway normally because I like to um, be able to push it up in, in post. But I do yeah. think that we have kind of pretty there. There's lots of color. And there's yeah. something, uh, when you shoot uh, things like this in, in sort of in a, uh, in a row, you know, and you have that nice depth of field, you have some real directionality and dimensionality, especially with that flower pot in the background. Oh, yeah. Uh, then if I want to use this sort of same setup, but kind of get away from that um, flower pot, I may move over a little bit and I'm just kind of throwing things around here and fruits and whatever for, and I'm creating a little bit of a, to come off the edge and really show you that I'm in an outdoor setting. So I missed a little bit. Yeah. You see I caught the edge of the pot. But oh, I'm yeah. Gonna, but I'm going to pull it back and get it out of the way and see if I can get a clean shot where you can see my drinks. You can see that I'm outdoors. And are you using your macro lens right now, Andrew? I am. I'm, I want to be able to get close. And you can see now that I kind of created a little bit of that, like, light bleed that comes in in the back. It's yeah. kind of good. So it gives me a little bit more of a feel of being outdoors. And I do think that getting lower and closer in here might even give me some more drama. And when you're focusing on glassware, you want to focus on the leading edge or what's in the top of the glass. Because if you're shooting in a shallow depth of field and you don't do that, then you're not going to have any focus at all. It's just going to, you're going to lose focus. So you can see here, I did that purposefully. You can see that my glassware is kind of out of focus. So I want to um, focus sort of in the middle here. Okay. So that I can actually have some of the drink in focus. And that gives me a lot nicer kind of focus. Oh, yeah. Might be harder yeah. to see the camera right now. But I also from the top it, it's very uh Oh yeah. That's nice. Yeah. 
So we kind of cheated a little bit with the. Uh, I'm going to take away that. I'm going to go straight over the top. Now, when you're focusing from the top, and I think we talked about this a little bit last week, you do want to remember um, to focus on the high point. Give me one second. I'm going to get another piece of fruit. Okay. So I'll take this time to remind everyone you're watching Creative Live TV. We are here with Andrew Scrivani at his home in New Jersey, learning how to make cocktails and how to take beautiful photos of them. Oh, you're adding a full piece of fruit to the shot, huh? Yeah, I'm putting it in for color. I don't know that I'm okay. going to but I am putting it in for color. And also I'm going to cheat a little bit more by taking this plant out. And I got one, one more trick here. This really pretty piece of driftwood. Oh. I got some air plants kind of living on there. And I got our drinks. So last week we talked a lot about the story that you tell through food. So what, you know, as you're kind of propping this, is there a story you're trying to convey right now? Yeah, I mean, clearly I'm trying to be summery. I'm trying to be tropical. I'm trying to be um, beachy. You know, like there's a lot, there's a lot to be said for just little, little bits and pieces. And this driftwood in the back may not read that way right away but it just kind of let um a little bit of texture to it it's not exactly doing what i wanted to do but it's i'm working it that's a little better it definitely gives you a sense of being outdoors yeah it totally does now I could do something else here. Because I'm going to get this table and really try to pick up what's going on behind. And then I'll, I want to talk about one other thing with glassware in a second. Yeah. So let me see if I can make this. definitely giving me a little bit more environment. I can't necessarily see the ocean, but I definitely get a sense of what's happening behind me here. Okay, so, so you're adding some height that you weren't getting before, right? Yeah, for sure. And then and it gives me the green in the background, a little bit of light bleed, even the railing, even the railing is part of the story. Yeah. So you can to see it's sort of oh yeah that looks that looks exactly like what you're doing you're enjoying a cocktail out on your beachfront patio yes but this kind of beach wood see now i have a little bit more see my my garnish is kind of fading a little bit but from uh. a from a an overhead perspective here even if I just eliminate one of these drinks and kind of go, you, you can kind of can't see what you're seeing on my other screen. Oh, there it is. Okay. There we go. There we go. So, so again, it's like, let me try this other guy. because We got those little blueberries floating around. Maybe just throw the lime in there. Okay, I'm going to tell you a couple of secrets about beverage photography and why this is only the 101 version of, of beverage photography. Yeah. 
because two things are happening here. One, my ice cubes are so white because they're not like uh, made with distilled water where they're nice and clear. This is another yeah. reason we end up using um, uh, fake ice cubes at, at certain points uh, because the white ice cubes are dominating the look of the drink. Yeah. That's the first point. Highlight the edges of the glass by inc incorporating some. So if I'm using the black, black color. Oh, I think we're uh, losing you just a glass. little bit. So in Your a cut. we're using flashes. Uh, I think we're all frozen. Are we all frozen? Yeah, uh, I think we're cutting out we're just a little bit. Okay. So when you're in a studio setting using the black cards, especially when you're blasting it with light, like a strobe or using an LED, you need to define the edges of the glass because sometimes you lose the edges of the glass in the light. And using black cards is a way to kind of have the glass have something to look at is, is the terminology I've heard uh, talked about before, where the edges of the glassware want something to see. So like the, because they're reflective, you want to put something in that um, reflection that is going to create um, some definition. So using black cards in beverage photography is really important. So two things, clear ice. If you can make it, buy it or use fake ice, that absolutely helps. Okay. Um, some of the things we've already talked about in terms of refreshing and keeping your garnish uh, fresh and, and green and vibrant, um, that helps. Now, clearly in photography, it's um, forgiving because we can uh, fix little imperfections in Photoshop. But if you're ever working in video, uh, this becomes even more problematic because you cannot correct those little mistakes. So your, um, your garnish, which you can see there, is still soaking in cold water. Um, the garnish needs to be, uh, the garnish needs to be as, um, fresh and vibrant as, as long as possible. So, uh, we're, we're learning a few little things here that as we go along in the process, but honestly, the one, the, the one that is the most problematic in this particular setup is that those ice cubes are just so white and they're just really dominating what we're doing. I mean, and the fact that it's hot out here is also sometimes a problem because one of the other reasons that we use, um, one of the other reasons we use fake ice cubes a lot of times is to prevent the sweat in the glass. So if we're doing like, um, like a glass of bourbon, let's say on the rocks, and that's a really nice look. But if you've ever had a glass of bourbon on the rocks, you know that after about five minutes, the glass starts to sweat. And that's not what the romantic view of a bourbon on the rocks in an oak paneled bar somewhere, you know, wherever is uh, that they're selling you, right? That, that, that has to be um, free of sweat. That's sweat free. So we're, uh, we're, we're out here in the sweaty 95 degree humidity <laughs> today. But, um, is there any questions about this? Because I mean, I, uh, I do not specialize in beverage photography, but I've done quite a lot of it. And um, it's, it would be interesting to know if anybody had any specific questions about beverage photography. Yeah, one of the questions that's coming in is just how uh, outside of ice, is there any other, um, you know, hacks or tricks that you use behind the scenes to make it a little easier on yourself. I think, you know, people in general, when you're shooting frozen things, um, that's a really hard thing to shoot as a photographer. So um, are there any other hacks like fake fake ice or um, things that you kind of lean on to, to help tell the full story? Well, I think uh, when you're, one of the biggest challenges with um, beverage photography in general, bottles, um, are the, obviously the shape of bottles because you can't always shoot in a, ver in a vertical plane. Sometimes your client okay. needs you to shoot in a horizontal plane. And I know that some people have a tendency to want to lay the bottle down on the table. I don't necessarily love that look. Um, I think yeah. it's a 
natural. And I, what I try to do is build a set that has a backdrop or shoot something against white, like a, um, a silhouette. And then a lot of bedford photography is um, composited. So oh. you should not be daunted by looking at bedford photography and going, well, how am I going to get that shot, right? Because most of it is done against white. So that it could be dropped into whatever background they want to do. So it becomes uh, more of a composited image. All of your absolute ads, a lot of your Bacardi ads, a lot of this stuff is done that way. It's very rarely done in situ because it's a really hard thing to do. Uh, okay. As we as we're discovering here, yeah. it, is very, it is a very challenging uh, thing to do. But it, it's a good exercise to try to do it in situ because it you realize the things that you, it's, it's definitely doable. Most of beverage photography I've done in my portfolio is in situ, but I have done quite a bit of it um, for clients. In, I worked uh, for a PR company for a while where I was doing beverage photography and there were a lot of bottle shots. And one of the hardest things to do with bottle shots is manage the reflections. So that black card trick goes not just black cards, white cards, uh, using things to manage um, reflection and keeping the room simple and keeping your camera at, you know, sometimes like I talked about last week where I, we, you would cut a hole in the, in, the, in the fill card and stick the camera yeah. lens through the hole. That's part of that trick too, because a lot of times when you're doing beverage photography, um, managing the reflection of the camera itself is, it can be problematic. So yeah. I'm here right now. This is not classic beverage photography because I'm out here in a situation out on the deck. But it is, um, you know, when you are in a situation where you have to manage reflections, you want to be in a less um, busy environment. So like in my studio, when I do beverage photography, I draw these black curtains all around the room so that there's nothing else for the, the glassware or the bottles to look at. Um, and, and reflect when I'm trying to make the picture. And then I can manage the flares and build, you know, if I want to build highlights with other lights, you know, to, to you know, a lot of times you, what you want to see on glassware or bottles is a really nice line down the side of the glass or the bottle in either black yeah. or white. And that's usually accomplished with either a black surface or black card for it to read like we talked about or some kind of a strip light or some streak of light that's coming in that's catching that edge of the bottle. So you want all of your reflections to be really intentional when you're working with beverage photography. So, um, so typically when you're, if you are shooting up uh, beverages, are you usually are working in a studio? You're not usually working with natural light. We, like we are in this situation, huh? There are times when I am, uh, I've done some jobs where I'd had to go out, gone out to a bar or gone out to uh, a restaurant that had a cocktail program that wanted to do it, um, in daylight. And, uh, I've done some that way and it's fine, but it's, again, it's really about managing the light, managing the, uh, the reflections. And a lot of times when you're in that situation, you don't want to do a macro lens because you're going to be too close and you're going to start to reflect yourself or the lens ah. in the glassware. Um, but like sometimes when you're in a really busy environment, like a bar with like all kinds of bottles behind it and everything else, it's okay because the reality is it's a busy environment and you're taking that picture in situation. You're not looking for it to be a standalone still life image. So you have to understand and appreciate that if you're going to, do something with intent to say, okay, I want to show this environment. Well, in that environment, there might be reflections in your glassware and that's okay. But when you're doing it intentionally for an advertisement where that, that image needs to be used in different ways, then obviously you need to take care to manage your reflections, give def definition to the glass, make sure that your exposure is never to never over. Because once you go over in beverage photography, like you have a blown out background and you lose the edge of the glass, it's gone. There's no yeah. information there and you're not going to get it back. And Kate, if you want to shoot it that way for effect, that's fine. But there needs to be intent. Everything you do has to have the proper intention. There are no happy accidents in photography. 
if you okay. if you are looking to do one thing and you do the opposite thing, you you didn't do your job. So you definitely want to um, make sure that you know that your client has expectations that you're managing, or you as the as your own client who's shooting for your portfolio, you are managing your own expectations and you know exactly what you want out of the picture. Um, and uh, and the thing is, is look. We're doing this live on TV, and I made one drink, and one of them was made about 30 minutes ago. That's <laughs> how we do it in real life. What we do yeah. is we make a very intentional, a purposeful attempt at each drink, and if we do need to do a group shot, we're doing that in big old hustle-up mode. Yeah. You know, you're getting ready, and you're getting that out on the set really fast. Um, so, like when we talk about doing things the way we're doing them today, yeah, if we're out, this isn't, if we're doing this for ourselves, that's one thing. But if we're doing it for a client, we would be handling this in a very different way. And I certainly wouldn't be mixing the drinks myself and then trying mm. to style them and photograph them. Uh, at least not three of them simultaneously. Yeah. But again, we're, uh, we're going to make uh, one, when I'm done here, I'll probably make one of these again and then try to get some, more um representative pictures of it when i have a little bit of time and i'm not doing both instruction uh <laughs> beverage making photography wedding at the same time because all yeah. simultaneously are as you can see <laughs> I, it's a lot of work it's always very obvious when the bald man is sweating <laughs> So before we come to a close, I wanted to talk a little bit about those. I recall from your new book, which is titled That Photo Makes Me Hungry. And every time I am doing this show with you, I'm getting hungry. Every time I look at that book, I'm like, what am I going to eat today? Uh, <laughs> in that, you talk, um, there's a photo of... Um, some cocktails and you talk about the importance of backlighting in uh, cocktail photography and how that kind of creates a mood. Um, so I want to talk a little bit more about mood of cocktail photography and often that comes with kind of the, the dark shadowy uh, aspects of lighting which make kind of tell you this story of being in a bar. We kind of took a different approach by going outside and creating this beachy environment. So speak to me a little bit more about how mood is conveyed in cocktail or food photography. Yeah. Um, years ago, I had to do um, a beverage sh uh, shoot. It was for the Melissa Clark column. And every year she would go to this uh, lake house with a friend who is a famous cocktail writer named Dave Wondrick. Right. Mm -hmm. So we had this conversation before we did the shoot because I was going to have to recreate the look in my uh, studio. So she told me, here's what we do. We sit out on the deck. It's very green. It's very woody and it's on the lake. So there's this dock and we sit out on the dock and we have drinks. I said, okay, that's great. Cause that's great information. So on the studio setup table, I set it up backlit because I wanted it to feel like light was streaking into the environment. Like we're sitting there watching a sunset or something to that effect, right? So we're setting the, setting the, the, the tone for the, the time of day effectively and mm -hmm. sort of almost any time of year. Then I got some plants like I did today and I kind of got them in the background. And I was, so there was this sort of essence of green in, in, in the, um, composition, right? And yeah. then the, the the part of it that I took from the instruction that she gave me was that this dock played a big role in the narrative, right? That they sat on the dock and they watched okay. the sunset and the woods and the lake and they had their drinks. So I got a, um, a slatted kind of picnic table that looked like slatted wood, like you would see on a dock side. And yeah. I used that as my table surface. So it was very subtle, but the combination of this beautiful yellowy, like lemony drink, right? That we put in, um, we put in uh, one of those pitchers that has a spigot on it. Yeah, yeah, I remember it now. 
that and then the green in the background, the reddish dock as the tabletop, and then the um and then the sunlight kind of streaking across the table. We created that dock scene on a tabletop, on a two by three tabletop. So like all of the intention of the little elements that were gonna create a mood. Now, unless you knew that she was sitting on a dock in the woods at a lake, you know, that whole setup might not be as literal as the way we what we intended it to be. Mm-hmm. But it still gave the feeling and the narrative of a summer afternoon, you know, in a, like a woody area. So yeah, it sort of totally. it gave you that feel. And we did that all on a two by three tabletop. But again, it's really about your lighting, your propping, your angles, and you know, the the intention that you bring to the narrative storytelling aspect of it. So if you want to build uh, a beach scene, now I could have, you know, put you guys up higher above my railing and got mm-hmm. below the the, the yeah, horizon and shot a picture so that you can just see the glass and the uh the glass and the beach background so like even like now i can kind of walk you over here back outside i'm going to put my glass right on my railing i'm going to flip this camera around and i'm going to compose the shot right here on the camera so uh how do i flip this oh i did it already okay so like if I'm if I'm here, I might have to get again my glass is kind of melty and whatever. But if I kind of went like that, this is here. Ah, here we go. Okay. So if I framed out the house, and I kind of got the background going like that, I'm, this is so hard to do. <laughs> Because I'm composing backwards. Okay, there we are. So, like, you know, I got go kind of go below the horizon line here. You can kind of see the ocean in the background. The parking lot isn't really helping. But you can get my drift in terms of what I'm trying to kind of sell there, right? So maybe there's a better way to do this. Hold on. We're going into mobile photography now. All right, let's see. Where are you taking us? Uh, there we are. Okay. So I'm going sideways. <laughs> I'm too low. Okay. So like, you know, eh. yeah, if that parking lot wasn't there, it would be perfect. Uh, kind of, I could frame around it. I could crop around it or I could maybe look, there we go. <laughs> I'm going to put the flat. <laughs> Cars. in front of the car there we go so you have to get creative when you're shooting at home you do you do have to get creative you do have to have the, the uh the, the sense that you know not everything is going to be perfect but you can actually crop around things and make certain things easier to um to work with if you're um you know if you're kind of in a situation where you're not in a studio you know, yeah. you're, you're home, you're making the best of it and you're going to, you know, just outside the frame is the parking lot or just outside <laughs> the frame is your cat, you know, so yeah. you got to work it out. That's what you learn about food photography is you're just zeroing in on a very small area and then you have no idea what's going on all around you, but yeah. that's that's the fun part about food photography is you can really focus in on the thing and it really doesn't matter what's going on around you because it's such a macro photography style. Absolutely. And the thing is that you can turn your three by two tabletop into anywhere in the world with enough, yeah, imagi- exactly. with enough imagination and enough uh, effort and, and careful intention uh, you can turn that two by three space into just about anything you want it to. And you can, yeah. you know, uh, what, when I worked for eating well for a long while, what they used to do is send me images of travel photography that was part of the story that we were going to work on. So they would go to, um, Florence or they would go to the Caribbean or they would go to Peru and they would take all of these environmental pictures that were going to be part of the story and they would give them to me first. 
And then I would match the color palettes and the lighting yeah. and the feel of it, the, the narrative of it, in order to match the pictures. And it was flawless because you could t it felt like where I took the pictures was where those environmental pictures were taken. Yeah. And that was really good training uh, for that. And then I actually, later on when I worked with them, the last one of the last stories I worked on them with was um, about the seven train in New York City which goes through all of these immigrant neighborhoods in Queens. And it's like a world food tour on the subway, like depending on where you get off the train. So I thought that idea was actually rather special. Um, and, I, and I did that. I, I went around and I just took all this environmental photography. And that was the basis for when we went back to the studio and built out the, um, the food work. Because we didn't shoot food in the field. We wanted to shoot it in a studio. But I did the same thing. I used those environmental pictures to influence the propping and the lighting and the, the setting and the feel of what we were doing uh, for the overall story. So if you Google it, you probably could find it. It's Chicken on the Seven Train, I think we called it. It was something like that for Eating Well magazine. It was a lot of fun. I'll, I'll try to find it and leave it, leave it in the comments so people can take a look at it. Yeah, it was cool. It was fun. And it, it was really, it was quite beautiful to, to meet all those people and kind of uh, weave them into the narrative of the food that they made and the lives that they were living in this sort of international swath of New York City, which is really cool. Yeah, it sounds like that was a really cool project. Well, that uh, brings us to the close of our show. It's one o'clock. It went by so fast. I'm sure it went by even faster for you because you're sipping on a cocktail. <laughs> and now I'm getting, getting green stuff in my teeth. So <laughs> really good on TV. All right, Andrew. Well, thank you so much for coming back to Creative Live TV. Again, this is the Work From Home Cafe with Andrew Scrivani. I am Kate Dessa, the co-host, and each week we're coming back to you at 12 o'clock Pacific Time, 3 p.m. Eastern Time to teach you a new recipe and how to take beautiful photos of it. So enjoy the cocktails this week, and we'll be back next week. Bye, everyone. Cheers, everyone. Hey guys, what's up? It's Chase Jarvis, founder and CEO of Creative Live. You all know that we have more than 2,000 classes and more than 10,000 hours of learning, inspirational, and motivational content on the platform. I'm super excited to announce a new experience on Creative Live. It's called Fast Class. You've told us that you're busy and sometimes it's hard to dive into a full class from start to finish. So essentially, we're now giving you a shortened highlight version of our top Creative Live classes. You can always dive into the full class with five, 10, or 15 hours of great content. But now, if you're just looking to focus on a few of the highlights or wanna be able to skip quickly to something that really interests you, you can now get a shortened fast class version of that class. We're also thinking this might be able to help you explore a new craft and save time while doing it. This is a great tool to curate your learning experience to help create the life that you seek. So you're probably thinking, great, how do I access this new experience on Creative Live? That's easy. All you have to do is be a subscriber to the Creator Pass, and then all this is yours. If you're feeling isolated and looking for creative connection, Try tuning in to creativelive.com slash TV. That's where we've got a 24 seven live stream from the kitchen counters. I can do that back lit shot that I really like to do. From the studios and living rooms of many of the world's top creators where we're doing musical performances, Q and A's, cooking shows, virtual book tour events, drawing, spoken word poetry, and more. Life passed me by waiting for an invitation when the world is greater than my nation or my occupation. Be someone you've never been. You feel all that adrenaline? It's medicine.
It actually helps me feel like my days are more purposeful. I hope that out of this deep pain will come some collective growth. Dive into Creative Live TV today.